I don't want to grow up, I'm a curious kid The world has a hundred questions I can play with So I'll open my arms and eyes And wonder every day till the day I die Now, UC Berkeley plant biologist Lorenzo Washington will present Barriers Between Friends. Lorenzo is a PhD student in the Plant and Microbial Biology Department of UC Berkeley, where he works at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. Before coming to Cal, Lorenzo graduated from Texas A&M University, doing research at the Plant Pathology Lab there. Please welcome UC Berkeley plant biologist and Wonderfest science envoy, Lorenzo Washington. And now we do the screen share dance. All right. So is the screen looking good for everybody? Looking very good. Do the presenter check. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction, Tucker. And uh, let's get started. So. To see the future of agriculture, you'll probably need a microscope. And that's not because we're going to be growing really tiny plants, but because we're beginning to understand just how useful our microbial friends can be. Now, you might be a bit familiar with this concept of microbial friends uh, in terms of humans. Whenever we talk about things like a gut microbiome, we're describing a community of microbes that helps us with everyday things keeping us from getting sick, better acquiring nutrients, and the like. And we're starting to understand much more as more research comes out. As it turns out, plants also rely on and utilize many microbes to tackle their everyday challenges. So why is this important for plant, or agriculture? Well, in modern agriculture especially, humans have done much of the legwork to help plants grow as best possible. You know, and these are for things that plants typically handle with the help of microbes, whether it be managing pest infestations, counteracting competitors or weeds, and acquiring enough nutrients to grow nice, healthy, and strong. Now, doing all of this as humans isn't easy, and how we've approached it has many negative side effects for both the environment and also those who work in the fields. Um, one of the largest issues in particular is related to fertilizer. Uh, producing fertilizer is an extremely energy intensive process and uh, which, you know, results in many emissions. And at the end of the day, through practices of how we apply it and just the nature of the uh, synthetic fertilizers themselves, we end up with a very low amount of uh, the fertilizer actually ending up in the plants that we're growing. And so this microbial discovery has shown us that there are other living creatures out there which have learned how to provide uh, some of these measures for the plants. And we don't necessarily have to be doing that ourselves. So you can think of it as prompting a recruitment of new teammates in the game that we call agriculture. And these new teammates can help us provide new solutions to unsustainable practices. We can help mitigate issues with modern agriculture and transition to more sustainable methods. However, our understanding of these mutualistic relationships is still pretty young. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done before this work can really take off. So an important part of understanding relationships is understanding the boundaries that they set. So my research focuses on the plant cell wall and the membrane as they are involved in these microbial friendships. Hence the title of my talk, Barriers Between Friends. Allow me to properly introduce myself. My name is Lorenzo Washington. I'm a third year PhD candidate in Henrik Scheller's lab at the University of California, Berkeley, here at the Joint Bioenergy Institute. And today I'm going to be talking about the who, where, and how of my research. So I'll introduce some of our new microbial teammates, talk about why I'm focused on the cell wall and the membrane, and then how I go about studying that. So back into talking about the plant microbiome a bit. So this, place, like with humans, as we come to understand it more, can better inform us how to grow healthy plants and how these microbes interact with these plants to uh, influence outcomes in agricultural settings. 
Now, these are very complex environments. As you can see in this image, we have microbes that live inside of plants. We have microbes that live on the roots. We have microbes that live in the soil. And all of these different communities can potentially influence things at the end or harvest that we would talk about. Now, with this very complex environment, we've come to find out that not all of the parts of the microbiome are actually that important or even the same between plants. You could have a whole field of say one type of plant and each individual plant could have a different kind of microbial community um, you know, with core exceptions that are consistent between them. Now, there are many interesting and important questions we can ask about the broad community we find in and on plants. However, there are some of the players in this microbiome uh, that are quite widespread in that many, many different kinds of plants that are, can be potentially drastically different from each other utilize the same kind of relationship with roughly the same kind of microbe. And when they do that, they end up uh, doing some pretty amazing things uh, that we found out. And so they've gotten and continue to get a lot of attention in the scientific space. So allow me to introduce some of our star players. We have the friendly fungi and the brilliant bacteria. And I'll be talking a bit more about specifics of these relationships as we go. Um, on the left, we have a uh, image of the friendly fungi. And so all the green you see here is actually a fungus and you're looking at a root section. So this fungus has grown into this root and you can think of it a bit like a personal farmer's market and that it is finding resources somewhere else and it will bring them to this plant to utilize. And then on the right, we have our brilliant bacteria. And in this image, all the blue you see is actually bacteria or bacterium, and all the pink you see is plant matter. And you can think of this relationship a bit like having a live-in chef. This is something that makes resources for you to utilize right there. And so the reason these relationships are very important comes down to this aspect that the plant provides sugars and an ideal place to live for these microbes. And in exchange, these microbes provide mineral nutrients for the plant. Mineral nutrients you can think of as fertilizers. And what I just talked about is that fertilizers in particular present quite a unsustainable problem in how we approach agriculture today. So that really comes down to being why we find these microbes so interesting. They can basically fertilize plants for us. And as we come to understand these relationships, we can tackle some of these problems. And so going a bit more in depth on each of these star players, first we have our friendly fungi, otherwise known as our buscular mycorrhizal fungi, but that's quite a mouthful. So we always call them AM fungi. And that's not just because they wake up really early. Um, so this is a really old relationship. Uh, it's almost as old as plants uh, on land themselves and a vast, vast majority of plants on land utilize this. Um, and this relationship you can think of as an extension of the root system. So mycorrhizal in Latin means uh, fungus root. And so this fungus, after growing into the root, spreads out into the soil and does what roots do. It collects water, collects nutrients, and brings them back to the plant that it's connected to with one key exception. This fungus isn't married to a single plant. It can connect to many other plants and a individual plant can connect to many other fungi. And so as we start doing the math, we realize that there can be extremely vast and complex networks of these fungal friends and these plants in the soil underneath our feet, trading resources back and forth and exchanging all sorts of other things that we have yet to learn. And so this, you know, brings up a lot of very interesting implications in regards to immunity and uh, working as a community as opposed to competition. And I always find it very useful to see actual images of these. So I'll be showing you some uh, what I consider very fascinating microscope images here. Now on the left, uh, and I do want to stress again, all the green you see is actually a fungus. There, none of the root is actually visible in any of the true microscope images. Um, and on the left here, you can see uh, the fungus growing through the root and below a cartoon rendition um, describing what this looks like in a bit easier to interpret terms. Um, and the little bushy structure 
uh, that you see along these uh, things here. Let me see if I can show my pointer, but that's always such a difficult thing. It's working. It is, okay, cool. Uh, and so these little bushy structures that we call arbuscules, which hence their name, you can think of as the stall at the farmer's market. This is where the action is happening. This is where the plant is giving the microbe sugars and the microbe is giving the plant its fertilizer and other things it purchases. Um, and so whenever you see one of these, this is where the magic is happening, essentially. And to kind of convey how extensive this process is, here on the right is an image that shows you the depth of a root. So you can think of it like I just cut into the root like a cake and I pulled it out and I'm looking at the side of it here. And you can see this is arguably, this root is arguably more fungus than root at this point, right? It kind of challenges your notion of what a, how much of a root should be plant at this point. Um, and so, you know, with this very extensive relationship, we zoom out a little bit and we begin to see that that's not just in one particular section, but this can stretch along a very considerable portion of a root system. Um, over a greater amount of time. I think the, both of these images uh, were taken about, I think two months after these plants were inoculated with this fungus. Um, and so, you know, this is just to convey like the sheer extent of how intimate this relationship can be with this fungus, uh, these fungi and the plants that choose to uh, work with it. And now moving on a bit to the brilliant bacteria, so this relationship similarly is pretty old, not quite as old as the fungal one and uh, a bit different from the fungal relationship, much less plants utilize this. We typically only see this in legumes. So beans, peas, peanuts, plants of that nature. Um, and the reason these plants are able to make this relationship is because they're able, they're capable of forming a special structure called a nodule, what I showed you a cross section of earlier. Um, and just like uh, the fungal relationship, in exchange for sugars from the plant, these bacteria then make nitrogen, specifically nitrogen uh, compounds for the plant to use. So basically plants are just straight up paying for fertilizer here, right? They have a pretty nice system. Um, and again, showing some images, on the left, you have a nodule that's been freshly cut open and you can see it's a bit red. And if you look on the right, you'll see a bit zoomed out what these look like growing on the root structure. They grow in these little clusters um, and you can see one thin root can produce quite a lot of these rather large uh, brown nodules. And the reason they're red is actually because for the bacteria to do this, they need a pretty low oxygen environment. Oxygen actually interferes with the reaction that they use to make this nitrogen fertilizer for plants. So to lean back into the in-house chef analogy I used earlier, this is kind of like you bought, you uh, hired an in-house chef, but then decided that your own kitchen wasn't enough. So you needed to build a nice new in-law unit with a state-of-the-art kitchen and all the fancy appliances so they can get to work and make you gourmet meals as much as you want. Now, this means that there are many, many changes required to the cells here and showing another cross-section. And in this cross-section, you can see uh, the yellow is actually all bacteria and all the rest are the uh, plant material themselves, the actual root being the small little bit down here. Um, and so the plant invests a lot of resources into setting this up and, you know, all these changes are required to happen. And so that leads us to trying to understand how does the plant go about making these changes? So for me, that leads me to looking at the cell wall and membrane. So why the cell wall and membrane? Well, they're the outermost structures we see on cells. So plant cells are a bit different than animal cells. They have, one of the main differences we see is they have a cell wall, which is at the very outer bit, and it provides structure and protection. However, uh, or rather similar to the buildings that we humans build, these walls aren't just for structural support and keeping unwanted things out. They need to be able to let things come and go. Signals have to be able to pass through them. Growth has to happen. So these are actually much more dynamic structures than we might consider them to be. 
And especially when we're dealing with the two groups of microbial friends, the fungi and the bacteria that I just mentioned, these structures are at the very least frequently degrading and rebuilding to accommodate them. As I've shown you uh, how extensive these colonization can be through the roots and just how uh, much these structures can grow up uh, to account for the bacteria. And going a bit into that, uh, we see the, these handy little infographics of this process for the AM fungi on the top and the bacteria on the bottom. And to walk you through that, on the top, we see uh, for AM fungi, uh, the fungi has to actually grow to the root. And once it finds its way to the root itself, it has to go into the root uh, or through a root cell. And then uh, once it's entered that cell, it's actually separated still from the plant because these plants don't want to truly share their cytoplasm or their insides with other microbes because then you're kind of presenting a lot of issues, right? When you have two individuals who decide to share the same insides. Um, so there's a very special membrane that's actually different from membranes we find in the rest of the plant that separates that fungi or the bacteria, as I'll talk about in a sec, from the rest of uh, the plant material. And in the case of the fungi, um, once they've kind of grown in between all these root cells and they decide that they want to set up a farmer mark or set up a stall or an arbuscule to start trading resources, they actually have to enter a root cell. So to do this, the cell wall has to be degraded and the fungi can then grow into that cell still being uh, surrounded by that special membrane. And for bacteria, we see a somewhat similar process. These bacteria have to find the root. Um, and once they find the root, they're in, they enter a outermost root cell, and then they're sort of guided by the special membrane down into the inner root, uh, down to the inner part of the root cells, where they trigger this process that causes the cells to re-enter the cell cycle and form the organ that we saw earlier called the nodule, which is now filled with these bacteria. Now, one, we have that special membrane that is present, and this membrane also has parts that are uh, we find in the cell wall in some cases, and also other parts that we haven't fully come to understand yet. And two, you see that just the simple act of letting these microbes into the plant requires a restructuring of the cell wall. It requires a restructuring, a regrowing, and a shuffling around of the membrane systems. And so very quickly, we start to have many questions that we can ask about these processes happening um, at these very microscopic uh, scales where these barriers are being degraded and reformed between these friends. And so how do I go about actually studying that? Well, like most plant biologists, I utilize mutants. Um, and so my model plant species, so the plant species that I do pretty much all of my uh, research in is a cute little grass called Lotus japonicus, pictured here on the right. Um, and I can grow them up in these sand cones and I also have other growth uh, methods I use. Um, but these, uh, this grass is actually a legume, so it can do both of these relationships. It can um, pair with these bacteria and it can also pair with the fungi. So that way I can study both in concert or independent of each other as I choose. And uh, the mutants in particular that I'm using are mutants in uh, cell wall and membrane related processes. So uh, you can think of it a bit like choosing to build a house with slightly different materials. So like one house I've made the walls out of oak wood and another I've made the walls out of pine wood. So it's a bit like that. I have some mutants that don't use certain sugars for their cell walls and some mutants that don't use other sugars for their cell walls, or they won't use a certain molecule in their uh, membrane formation, or they will use this other molecule that they normally won't in their membrane formation. And with these very specific differences, I can now start to ask questions about how this influences these processes by growing them up alongside their friends, and seeing how things shake out compared to normal. Um, and I can do that through sort of the typical molecular biology ways of looking at genetic expression um, and, and those things. But also, as you might have come to uh, guess by some of the images I've been showing you, microscopy is a very big part of this process because we're actually able to physically see what is going on and we can start to do things like figure out statistics and other metrics 
um, to determine just how extensive these friendships may or may not be getting um, in these mutant systems. So some images to show you what that might look like. Uh, on the left here, you have a, uh, a root nodule. So again, this is where bacteria are inside making nitrogen for that plant. And these bacteria are actually changed to where they grow, um, they produce a fluorescent protein. So it's a protein that when we shine a, a certain kind of light on it, it glows up a specific color. And so you can see what that looks like in normal light on the left. And then the middle image is that same nodule with the proper light being shown on it. And so this helps me to actually see where these nodules are because it's not always easy to see them, especially in their younger days. Um, and also provides a, a bit more information in terms of like what I am looking at, where I should be looking, and it makes comparisons much easier. Um, and the image on the right is uh, sort of another growth setup I can utilize um, to ask some questions. The difference between this and something like the sand cones I showed earlier is that growing them in this closed system that I can actually look at the roots as they're growing allows me to check the same plant over time, as opposed to having to pull it out, clean it off, and only check it at one time point, and then my sample has been messed with too much to be used again. Um, so, yeah, and as I talk here, uh, this is, I'm nearing the end of my talk here, and that's because a lot of this work that I've been doing the past few years has actually just been setting up everything I need to properly ask these questions that I have. Um, when you're dealing with multiple kinds of organisms that are different kingdoms of life um, and are finicky about different things like what kind of nutrients they have, things can be a bit difficult. And with COVID especially, as we all know, work has slowed. So I unfortunately don't have any like proper data to show you. And today I just wanted to kind of introduce you to some of the fascinating aspects that we have when we look at microbes and plants working together. So as I round up my talk here, um, the who, where, and how, right? So who, the star players that we've seen rise up from the microbiomes of plants are AM fungi and nodulation bacteria, both of which provide nutrients to plants in exchange for sugars. So you can think of it a bit like paying rent. And the fungi themselves also connect plants as a community, which leads to a lot of interesting questions and ideas that can be implemented once we have some more information. And where, the cell wall membrane, these are the boundaries that separate them. They are dynamic, they are constantly changing spaces, and especially when these uh, friends decide to get together, uh, the, the kind of dynamic we see and the kind of change we see becomes a bit more predictable and a bit more interesting to ask questions about. And how do I view this? I go about using mutant plants. I utilize microscopy to actually see what is happening. And I also utilize traditional molecular biology methods to see what's going on with the genetics of uh, our species that we're looking at. And with that, thank you very much for listening. And I would like to give a huge thank you, of course, to Wonderfest and also to some very helpful people in the lab, funding sources. And I do want to acknowledge that the land I live and work on is unceded to Chenyo Alone Land, and I want to shout out to the Shumi if you haven't heard of it. Uh, the Sogrea Land Trust, Sogrea Te Land Trust, is a great organization that deserves the support. So, thank wow, you. Lorenzo, thank you. It's just a quick question. I've never heard of the Shumi. Where where are they located? Uh, so the Shumi is actually like the name for the process itself. Uh, uh, it means gift in Alone, uh, and okay. basically oh. it's like a um, you can think of it like a, a voluntary tax. So you. I, what I did, I, it was like 60 bucks for me. I put in my, how much I pay in rent and um, where I, you know, uh, in the East Bay and they calculated that like, okay, you would owe us like 60 bucks based on this. And so I then mowed them the $60. I mean, um, they have it for like businesses. You can do it as like a corporate kind of thing. You can do it as a personal kind of thing, um, but definitely something worth checking out if you've never heard of it. All right. Let me ask one more broad question before we zero in here on your uh, your your thoughtful listeners, admirers questions. I you've been working with the Joint Bioenergy Institute at Cal, yes? Yes. In what sense is it no, joint? Actually. Who who are they joining together? Who is joined together there? And bioenergy, in what regard bioenergy? 
So uh, joint, I believe, because we're an extension of the uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Labs, and also many researchers here are not connected with Berkeley in any capacity aside from being at JBay. So we have, um, we're the National Labs and the Department of Energy and Berkeley. So it's like a lot of different research entities coming together. And then the reason it's bioenergy is because actually the core mission of this facility is to develop um, bioenergy crops for things like, you know, uh, sorry, uh, biological based fuels as opposed to petrochemical based fuels. Um, and so a lot of our work uh, kind of comes down to whether we're a microbiologist or a person, a chemist or a plant biologist, a lot of our work comes down to finding ways to make um, bioenergy crops a sustainable and viable option in the future. Great, thanks Lorenzo. All right, Stuart Usum asks, I presume that the bacteria, I'm oh, sorry, it just jumped. I presume that the bacteria are converting atmospheric nitrogen into nitrogen compounds. You mentioned that oxygen is bad. It interferes with the bacteria, yes or no? I presume that a, that a looser soil would allow more air to be available for gas capture and conversion, yes or no? But it would also allow more oxygen to be present too, yes? Mm. So is there something going on to limit the oxygen or protect against the oxygen? Yeah, so wonderful question. Um, I, I'm not a, uh, my soil science uh, training is a bit old. Um, so I, I can't talk as much to like the pore size related to how much nitrogen or oxygen we see. But what I do know is that, um, especially for this bacteria, they don't actually fix nitrogen until they get inside the plant. So uh, the way they do it, oxygen is just so inhibitory to this process and they require so like, they require a lot of energy to do this. So when humans do it, it's extremely energy intensive. When bacteria do it, it's also extremely energy intensive except it's bacteria doing it. So they don't need as much energy because um, they're not making as much. And so because of this, um, they aren't able to do this in the soil. Oxygen gets in the way too much. They don't have enough resources. And so they really require that nodule so they require the ideal environment, the nice, you know, remodeled kitchen and everything for them uh, to really get to work making that fertilizer um, for the plants. And uh, I, I believe I, I briefly mentioned it earlier, but that red color that you see inside the nodules is actually hemoglobin. So these, that's the same uh, thing that carries oxygen in our blood. And plants found out a way to make it themselves. And they produce it in these nodules specifically to bind oxygen and keep it from interfering with the bacteria making their nitrogen. Ironically, the bacteria still need oxygen to live. So it's a bit of a tricky balance to acquire, but plants have managed to make it work. All right, I see two raised hands. Jim Stoffer, please unmute yourself and ask away. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm a gardener. And uh, so sometimes bacteria and fungi represent a problem uh, for gardeners. And I was wondering if these uh, benign uh, organisms that you've been talking about ever become uh, a little nasty, like if the plant is stressed and isn't producing what they need, would they uh, actually start uh, uh, degrading the plant in order to get what they need? Absolutely wonderful question. Thank you for that, Jim. Uh, yeah, so it kind of depends on uh, what microbe we're talking about. So the bacteria are, are a bit more truly benign. Um, if they're not getting what they want uh, out of the relationship, they just kind of go away. Or if the plant decides that this is too expensive for them to do, they get rid of them. So something that I didn't mention was that um, in actually both of these cases, if the plants receive all the fertilizer they need from like human application, they won't do this because they'll still have to give these bacteria sugars and make all these structures and go through all this work. And it's like, why would I build a whole new kitchen for my in-house chef if someone's delivering me food every week, right? So there's that. Um, but also we see a lot of variance in these relationships. So some bacteria are actually really creative and they're not all that great at making nitrogen, but they're really great at taking those sugars. So they're kind of playing the game a little bit. And especially when we get into uh, the AM fungi realm of things, um, we see a really wide variance in actually how um, for different species and varieties of this fungus, of how much it actually benefits plants. Um, and we see the same sort of thing where if we provide enough fertilizer, 
the plants won't make this relationship. But also, as a plant gets stressed and gets sick, for the fungi, there's some pretty fun aspects because the fungi can potentially provide the plant with resources from other plants to actually kind of protect its food supply. Um, so in a way, it can be altruistic. In other ways, it can kind of just keep charging the plant the same price and give its resources to the plant that's doing really well to hedge its bets and keep its food source uh, secure with the, the stronger competitor. So there is a lot of like stochasticity uh, to, in these relationships, um, but it kind of comes down to, I guess, what species you're dealing with. Um, but really at the end of the day, these aren't, it, it's extremely contextual if these are gonna like actually truly harm the plants or not. Um, and they do much less damage than say like a true pathogen would. Thank you. I, I see we've got some great questions here. Kramer Winslow asks, please tell us more about the contained growth system, your next to last slide. How long did it take to grow those plants to the degree you showed and how do you plant them in that little device? Yeah, so uh, these, I believe in this image, uh, these plants are probably three to four weeks old. Uh, this is actually at another lab. This was back when I was trying to figure out how to do this myself <laughs> uh, from uh, other collaborators. Um, and it's actually pretty easy. What you do is you take the seeds, you um, do what you have to do to germinate them. In my case, it's rub them with sandpaper very carefully and then soak them in water overnight. Um, and then I have these plates. Uh, so they're like small Petri dishes that are square and I pour in nutrient uh, agar solution. And then I put a little piece of paper over it so the root doesn't grow into it. And then I just place the germinated, uh, the seeds that I've germinated on that. And then I use the metal bar to make sure they don't fall and block the light. And then I just cover the roots up and I leave the plants and they can grow anywhere from a couple of weeks to a month, I think, um, depending on what I need them for. Neat, neat. All right, Adelaide Nye finally gets a chance to ask a question. Here we go. I'm in the middle of reading Merlin Sh Sheldrake's book, Entangled Life, Adelaide says. I was already in love with mushrooms, but wow. And now it is so delightful to see your pragmatic research into how it might, how it might be possible to use these interrelationships to work toward new ways of plant interactions that might one day replace fertilizer. What would be the next plant micro plant microbe or fungus interaction you'd like to explore? Uh, great question. I feel like the since I've come into this research, I found out that there's just like a, a vast world of this that we're just beginning to truly understand. Um, but I think if I weren't to study AM or nodulation anymore, I'd be really interested in studying this process called, it's not so much a particular single interaction, but a process called uh, rhizophagy. So it basically means root eating. And as we found out, plant roots actually kind of eat microbes as they grow at their chips. And they there's this whole process where they, they recycle resources from them and it, it potentially helps them like determine what direction's going on and things. Um, and it was just like a new way of it, plants kind of just like farming microbes for resources, which I, I it blows my mind of how creative plants can get in their relationships uh, and wait like from what I was taught basically in basic biology uh, as a high schooler, so. Thanks, Lorenzo. Thank you, Adelaide. Lorraine Yamaguchi asks, how does harvesting and crop rotation affect the mesh formed by fungi? How long does it take the fungi to form its broad colony? Again, wonderful question. Um, so as uh, some of our, uh, the studies that we have done so far, uh, primarily from like field ecologists and agronomists, uh, we have seen that practices like no-till um, farming uh, do benefit these relationships because when we're kind of going through um, harvesting a bunch of things, we're killing off these root systems, which in the case of AM fungi, they, are, they absolutely require plants to complete their life cycle. If they don't grow inside a plant, they can't get what they need to make spores and continue on. Now their spores can reside in places for a while, but the actual fungus won't make it very long. Um, so if you just, you know, bare cleave a whole field, it's a matter of time. The roots might survive for a while, but it's only a matter of time. And then if you go in and till everything up, you're releasing the spores into the air, potentially, or you're removing them from the space. And so when you go and plant the next season, there might be less there. 
Um, or if you're planting a different plant, the relationship might not be the same. So there is definitely a lot of uh, intention that can be done with this practice. You could uh, sort of plant a series of uh, plant species that all cohabitate with a particular kind of AM fungi, and you can have uh, other kind of other practices within what you do, such as no-till, that can help reinforce a really dense network forming underground that you can keep using season after season. Thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, I've, I've saved our last question to uh, for somebody whom I think you know. So just in case he's a ringer, he's your last interrogator. Evan Groover is a Wonderfest former, or maybe current too, Wonderfest science envoy, and he's given some great talks for Wonderfest. So Evan, please have at poor Lorenzo. <laughs> hey, great talk, man. Um, I'm so intrigued about this thing you mentioned, how, you know, different plants are connected by, you know, through their roots, through fungus. And, you know, there's this idea out there that, you know, of the wood wide web, right, that all the trees are connected and they're exchanging nutrients and they have this interaction through, you know, the fungal symbiosis that they share. And I wonder how much credence you pay to that. Is that a, do you think that that's a, a thing that we should be taking seriously, that, you know, plants might be communicating through this fungal interaction? I feel like I, I'm still kind of in my process of fully, um, of like fully landing on an, on an answer to that question. However, I do, I don't know, I'm, I'm getting a bit fantastical, I suppose, with it, but I kind of think that maybe, honestly, I think that there's kind of a, a level of this that we haven't gotten to really fully understand yet. And when you haven't gotten to fully understand something, it seems a bit fantastical at first. But like we see all sorts of really bewildering interactions between plants. Uh, honestly, like we see trees that specific that that preferentially share resources with trees of their own species or even their own germline. So like their own seedlings and not other seedlings. Um, we see uh, you know fungi that are capable, or I guess this is more from the fungal perspective. But like I said, fungi that are capable of like taking resources from one place and moving them to an area that doesn't have as many resources and like changing how much they charge for the, the, you know, how much sugar they receive for them. And we even get to things like <clears throat> um, plants kind of having a sacrificial member uh, where they send uh, things like heavy metals or other toxic um, components that we can find in soils that would otherwise harm plants. And they can concentrate them into like a single sacrificial plant <laughs> so that the community can grow better. Um, and, you know, I guess depending on the perspective you take, whether you're like, okay, is this the, the fungus that's controlling things and hedging its bets for a food source? Or is this the plants kind of hedging in their will here? Um, changes how you go about it. Either way, I think this challenges what we consider intelligence from my perspective. Obviously, I'm very biased as I study plants themselves, but I think that a lot of these behaviors are things that we would attribute an intelligent being of being able to do. Um, and just because we don't understand the mechanism or just because we don't understand the nitty gritty behind a mechanism doesn't mean that that species isn't intelligent and isn't in fact communicating in its own way. So, Like the best case scenario. Thanks, Louisa. I see that Jim didn't, doesn't have a question, but Stuart does have a final one here. I believe this is for you, Lorenzo. Are there some bad environmental factors such as pesticides or herbicides, which may kill off or otherwise interfere with this natural relationship between plants and bacteria or fungi? Another great question. Um, so yes, uh, there are like, for example, you know, some agricultural systems rely heavily on things like fungicides and fungicides similar to like how we use antibiotics are really broad acting. They're not super specific. They just kind of bash all fungi. Um, and when that gets in the soil, it can damage these relationships. Um, but really uh, uh, with, when it comes down to it, uh, ironically, out of all things, the thing that diminishes these relationships the most is the fact that we fertilize our plants. Um, extensively, like a lot, um, to, to help them grow. Um, and because we're kind of like always delivering plants the food they need to their doorstep, they don't go through the process of setting up these relationships. And actually, it's kind of even worse with the plants that we typically use in agricultural setups because 
of how we bred them and how we've gone about deciding what are the best plants to use when we grow. We didn't have a full or even a working understanding of most of these relationships. And so that wasn't in mind. Uh, and as a result, a lot of the plants aren't as good at using these as some of their ancestors or some of their less bred um, cousins might be. And so at the end of the day, um, with specifically these two relationships, it really comes down to, you know, are we providing too much of this resource ourselves? And should we kind of pull back and let our microbial teammates pull a little more of the, the weight that we know they can pull? 